Hello, I'm Sarah Batten, Oshman Executive Director of San Jose Museum of Art. I'm joining you tonight from the sky bridge of the museum with the Plaza de Cesar Chavez just behind me. The museum, as you may know, is owned by the city of San Jose and was founded in 1969. It's also on the unceded land of the Ohlone people. We celebrate the continued presence of Ohlone descendants who are working today to preserve and nourish their indigenous identity. I am very happy tonight to share SJMA's third Thursday program with our partners at Mosaic America, moderated by our friend, Usha Srinivasan. This is the fourth year of partnership with Mosaic which included extensive performances and engagement on site pre-COVID and a pivot to virtual programs over a year ago. Mosaic's work focused on cultivating and belonging and fostering inclusion is very much in line with our efforts to create an inclusive and welcoming space for the whole community, a radical reimagination of museums. We share with Mosaic a commitment to the importance of creating opportunities for public conversations on complex issues, like the program tonight, focused on the documentary film, From Here, with panelists, Sunny Singh and Tanya Matos, who are featured in the documentary. In fact, we met Sunny in December when he co-led a building racial equity training for our entire staff. So tonight for me is serendipitous. I was very inspired by so many things about the film, including Sonny's own words at the end of the film when he asks, who is going to challenge our communities to do better? And that means acting out of love. That's how you build solidarity. So it is now my pleasure to introduce your moderator for this evening, Usha Srinivasan. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you very much. Uh, and thank you to San Jose Museum of Art for four years of partnership and allyship. We're very grateful for um, all the times that you've held space for us and uh, for our programming and also for sharing valuable resources. Um, thank you also to our marketing partner, the Commonwealth Club of California. We're very grateful for their support. Good evening. And uh, today's program, given today's program, which is um, from here, uh, belonging in an era of rising nationalism. Um, given that discussion and topic, I think it's important that we acknowledge um, all the events happening around the globe and right here in our own backyard, the raging pandemic and the resulting waves of anti-Asian hatred, uh, the strife in Palestine with lives lost every day. Um, and right here in our own backyard, efforts that are afoot to restrict voting rights in that desperately impact black and brown communities. All of these have at their core, this contested notion of belonging, who belongs, who gets to determine who belongs and what are the rights that come, rights and privileges that come with belonging. So our conversation today, again, is about the documentary film From Here. And uh, if you haven't watched the film, um, no problem. I know we shared the links multiple times, but uh, we have structured this discussion so you will still be able to get a lot of insights and hopefully value out of the discussion, even if you haven't watched the film. And um, to summarize briefly, the film was really about 10 years in the making and um, it was filmed in New York and Berlin, and it features the interweaving stories of four people, Tanya, Sunny, Maimon, uh, and Akim. And um, these are activists and artists who were raised in the global north, Berlin and New York, um, by parents from the global south. And the film accompanies them on this journey over through their late 20s and into their 30s. And, uh, uh, tracks them as they confront many different turning points in their lives, as they try to start families, they struggle with um, survival, surviving violence, uh, fight for citizenship, 
and uh, also still find a way to create art. And uh, while this is all happening in the background, uh, the political landscape changed quite dramatically over these years. And what we found was that both in um, New York as well, and uh, sorry, in US as well as in Germany, there was a rise of the right wing and that had real impact on our four protagonists. And what they found was the homeland that they were living in was turning inc increasingly hostile to their existence. So this is a powerful film. And I noticed that there are some people who are expecting that it would be streamed here today. And no, the film is 90 minutes long, but we did provide you all with a link to watch it. But again, like I said, if you haven't watched it, that's not a problem. Um, we have here today, uh, three very inspiring artists, activists who are an uh, integral part of the film. Uh, Christina Antonakis Wallace, Tanya Matos, and Sunny Singh. And I'd like you to kind of join me on camera and welcome. Um, now, I have to say that Sunny Singh is the only one among the three of them that actually has been on a rock band. Um, but I have to say you are all rock stars and you really are. Anyone who watches the film will, will attest to this. Um, so rather than kind of read out bios, what I thought we would do is, um, you know, just kind of maybe allow you guys to introduce yourself because not, no bios I read can really do justice to your stories. And um, what I also would love to invite you to do is to perhaps use the prompts, I am, I strive for, and I dream of. Again, you're welcome to, to find alternate prompts. And so since I made these prompts, I think it's only fair that I go first. I am Usha Srinivasan, I'm a mom, and I come from Saratoga, which is on the unceded ancestral lands of the Muwekma Ohlone tribe. I am the CEO and co-founder of Mosaic America, whose mission is to move diverse American communities from diversity to belonging through intercultural arts. And through my work at Mosaic, I strive to cultivate belonging, um, foster inclusion by bringing together artists, culture bearers, and others um, across cultural divides to co-create and co-present works um, that foster better understanding of history, foster great shared experiences, and allow people to perhaps view things around belonging and inclusion in new ways. So, um, and I dream of a day when nobody in America is asked, where are you really from? And I dream of a day when uh, no one is asked to go back to where you come from. So with that, I will invite Tanya to, to introduce herself. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for having, for having me uh, on today. Um, I feel so honored to be able to be in this space and to share uh, our perspectives and our stories and, and in particular my life uh, on screen um, that you were able to see uh, that was 10 years in the making. But um, again, my name is Tania Matos. Um, I go by she or hers. I was born in Bolivia, uh, which was... Um, originally the land of uh, Tiwanaka, uh, and I live in New York, uh, in Queens, New York, which is uh, the land of the Lenape people. Uh, and for me, I dream and strive for a day where everyone on the planet has, uh, will achieve and we will reach a place where we can strive for the right to happiness and safety. Um, so, you know, imagining a world where we have all our basic needs met, um, right to housing, a right to uh, water and air, so we can go to the next level and really push for a right to happiness and safety as a human right. Sunny, you're next. <laughs> Okay. Um, hi, everyone. Thanks so much for, for having us today. Um, my name is Sunny Singh. I use he and him pronouns. Um, I am based in Brooklyn, New York, also the land of the Lenape and the Canarsi. Um, I am a, a musician, a popular educator, and an activist. And uh, I love these prompts. Um, I strive uh, through, my, uh, through my education and activism work to really 
ignite and inspire others to, to take action for social and economic justice, to think critically about the world, about root causes of social problems, uh, and to do everything in our power to, to fight for justice and liberation. Um, that is a fire that burns in me and I hope to help ignite it in, in others um, and help provide folks with some of the tools and skills to actually do that in an effective way. Um, and, uh, and I dream of a world uh, where uh, humanity comes before profit, right? Where uh, basic human dignity comes before greed. Uh, I dream of a world without hierarchy and oppression. Christina. That leaves me. <laughs> um, I am Christina Antonakis Wallace and I'm the director and producer of From Here. And I might not be quite as concise, unfortunately, I'm going to try. These prompts opened up so much for me because Usha sent them to us last night and I've been sort of mulling them over. So um, I'm obviously a filmmaker, an artist, an activist. I'm also a cultural organizer. So that means I'm somebody who's using cultural practice to try to organize for change and liberation. Um, I'm Greek American, I'm queer. I live in occupied Duwamish territory, coastal Salish lands, which is now called Seattle. But I've also made home in other places, Berlin and New York, especially, and Athens have all been places that have been home for me. And I really strive for a world where we recognize our fundamental interdependence and inherent dignity. Um, so that working in solidarity becomes obvious as part of our own survival as individuals, but also what type of group we're a part of. We understand that working on behalf of others is essential for us as well. And that for me really means fighting for material equality as well as cultural and social equality. And I strive to create work that really invites people into dialogue in compassionate ways with themselves and others. And in many ways, I do feel like this film is, you know, hopefully an invitation to be in dialogue with others, but also with our own relationships to our own identities and our own sense of belonging. Um, I dream of a free Palestine. I think we need to say that today. <laughs> I dream of a, a free Palestine and I dream of a world where we understand power as something we share with others and not power as something we have over others. Um, and I dream of the survival of our species and the survival of many other species in a moment where, you know, um, extinction is not out of the realm of possibility at all. And I think that sounds very doomsday, but I actually think that we have to dream a new world into reality in order for our species to survive and not just uh, the elites who can afford to kind of cloister themselves off, but the rich diversity that is humanity and is life as we know it currently. So. And, and where that all fits in with migration is I think migration is part of this, this life force, this flow of people and, and life. It, it, migration is very fundamentally part of our survival. Um, so I, I really dream of a world where we can embrace migration as part of our natural reality um, and, and, and create systems to make it possible. Thanks. Thank you so much. That was really inspiring and beautiful. Um, and now if I may ask Sunny, if you would just tee up the first section, what we've done is created little montages of clips that we've taken from the film um, that will anchor our discussion on a particular topic. Um, just keep in mind that this is not how the film plays out. It's just we've selected clips um, to offer you something to give you um, the background, if you will. So Sunny, please go ahead. Hier in Deutschland ist man halt ein Ausländer. Und man ist ja offensichtlich ein Ausländer. Aber das Krassere ist dann, wenn man nach Vietnam geht, dass man dort auch ein Ausländer bleibt. Ich teile diesen Zustand ja mit ganz vielen jungen Leuten. just come out that I'm undocumented and not being in denial. Coming out, that was just the most liberating feeling in the world. I mean, I have cultural and social citizenship to this country, but I don't have legal citizenship, which means a lot. I can't legally work. I can't travel. I can't drive, get any health care, any government assistance. 
You have to be very, very crafty about how to make it, but you get tired. I'm American, but I'm in this situation. And because of this, I've had to hide. I've had to hide for so long, but I, I'm gonna have to, I have to let it out. I can't take it anymore. I can't live like this anymore, and I exist. Growing up in, in Charlotte, North Carolina, looking the way that I looked, which was kind of like I look now, but smaller and no beard, um, was, was a challenge to say the least. Um, by like, no exaggeration, my brother and I were the only two Sikh boys. So that was like really isolating and difficult. The early Let's musician. Look at your bow tie. Very impressive. A friend of my mom's He-Man. drew this. It's He-Man on a piece of paper and then my mom put it on the cake. Oh yeah, the axe. I was really into He-Man, ironically. <laughs> In the fifth grade, some kid pulled off my turban on the playground. Like that was the first time that happened. Um, and so the, this, and, and at that point, I didn't even know how to put on a turban myself, you know? So I was walking around school the rest of the day, like with my turban, like hanging off of my head. I mean, talk about humiliating. I also remember filling out this worksheet in school. And I remember my top wish was, uh, I wish I could cut my hair. Um, there was a real desire to be white. Like I wanted my name to be like John and I wanted to like have a nice haircut and like play basketball, you know, like that. That, that's how I felt, you know, and, it's, and it's, it's hard to admit that. I had no courage to stand up for myself or my people at that point. Thank you. Thank you, Sunny. Um, like I said, that's a beautiful film. And if that moved you, I can just, um, you can just imagine what the rest of it was like. Um, so, um, this film, Christina, tackles belonging from many different angles. There's obviously many aspects to belonging. Um, there's kind of immigration and uh, citizenship. There is race and identity. Um, and obviously, but before we even get started on a discussion of belonging, I would love for you to kind of just ground us in the concept of belonging and maybe the terminology around it so we all have a starting point. Yeah, thanks for that, Usha. And um, I just wanted to share with you all who are in the audience, Usha chose these little selects that you are seeing from the film. She thoughtfully watched the film and chose moments that she felt really illuminated um, these ideas. So I just wanna appreciate the care and attention you put into um, the film, watching the film and, and sharing it with your community who's here on screen with us today. Um, in terms of belonging, you know, the language of belonging wasn't how I started with the film. Um, it, I think that um, I personally was grappling with these questions of identity and race and immigration and how do these all things relate to each other and nationalism. And it was really actually Tanya and the work of the um, undocumented youth movement in the US that was really explicitly challenging what it means to belong, what it means to be American that I was able to kind of put those pieces together into language in my own head. And then through that, I started to find this whole ecosystem of, of, of ideas that has been growing and emerging around the idea of belonging. So I'm really grateful um, that like any um, sort of zeitgeist, like these ideas are coming from many different places. They're kind of coming from sort of activist work, but also coming from people who are working on sort of spiritual spiritual work and people who are working on legal change. So um, I would say belonging is like most powerfully articulated as being in opposition to othering or sort of a counter, counter vision to othering. So if we see um, so many systems based on creating an us versus a them, how do we create an us without a them? How do we create a, a system that actually recognizes all of us our inherent um, right to be here and share this, this earth that we were all born into equally. <laughs> um, so it's funny that we should even guess anyone doesn't belong. We all belong here, right? But we have to remember that, recognize that, create systems that actually allow that to be true. Um, and it, I think that something that I personally find really valuable about this framework is that it allows us to not just articulate what we're against. We're obviously against racism. We're against 
sexism or against all these systems of oppression. Um, but we're actually for cultivating belonging for all. Um, that's That's been very liberating to me to actually have something that I'm able to, and, and to actually see how it can span these different levels of, of not just talking about political change, but also talking about the transformation we need inside of ourselves. You know, I need to know that I belong also in my own body. I need to know that I belong to my own skin. And then I can also talk about belonging to my neighborhood, my family, my community, and how do we, my, my country, this planet, how do we understand and recognize our belonging on all those levels? So for me, that ha has been one of the ways that this framework of ideas has really um, inspired me and also to feel that all these struggles that I was a part, a part of that maybe had, okay, there's the, you know, racial justice movement over here and there's the justice, the climate justice movement over here and there's, you know, cross pollination, but like what actually ties these things together? It's like actually recognizing our interdependence, our need for each other, our fundamental equality, our fundamental dignity. Um, so that's what's encompassed for me in belonging. And I think that migration and national borders are one of the ways that belonging is most uh, militarized and policed in the world. So who is allowed to cross which border, um, how people, what kind of um, rights and access they have to basic material, um, you know, sustenance is very much just defined by these ideas of national belonging. And we have told ourselves stories for a couple generations that these things are totally normal um, and taken for granted. But, you know, these nation states that we live in are not that old. There were a whole other organizations of societies and completely different borders not that long ago. Um, so, you know, ultimately, I think I'm a person who would like us to get beyond borders. Mm -hmm. um, but I understand it's gonna it's gonna take some work to get there. <laughs> and um, yeah, so so that's where I'm coming with with belonging. Thank you. Thank you. Um, you know, I heard, um, I think it was Professor Powell from the Othering and Belonging mm -hmm. Institute who talked about, you know, Maslow's hierarchy says, you know, food, shelter, and then belonging, but really belonging, you could argue, is actually even more fundamental. Mm -hmm. And um, it can be actually, because the lack of the belonging, the othering aspect of it, can really be a threat to survival. And Sunny, um, clearly from watching the movie, I could tell that um, the heckling that you go through, the Islamophobia that was aimed at you, um, for you, it was oftentimes a, a threat. Yeah, most, most definitely. Um, and and that, takes, that takes its toll. Um, for someone like me, who's lucky enough to have not faced a lot of physical violence uh, due to racism and Islamophobia and, and xenophobia, um, and other manifestations of white supremacy, right? These are all manifestations of white supremacy. Um, the, the emotional and mental toll is, is, is really deep um, and, and is still with me. And it's a, it's a true form of trauma, even, uh, even without the physical violence. It's that constant threat, that hypervigilance that we as othered people, we as marginalized people uh, just have to live with, right? Our normal is like always watching our backs, right? Um, and in times where the harassment I was dealing with was was practically daily. That that is what it felt like to to walk in my uh, to to live in my skin, right? Is to always be on high alert, and and of course that that takes quite quite an emotional uh, emotional toll, indeed. Yeah, and Tanya, um, the sense that I got from watching you through this film was not so much that you were asking for somebody to 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 give you something to tell you you belong, but rather you were kind of claiming. We're here, you know, it's up to you to acknowledge and honor our existence and do the right thing. Um, does that, is that a fair assessment? Yeah, a hundred percent. I think that's a, that's a fair assessment. Uh, and, you know, for, for most of my life, I'd say that um, we, people like me uh, who, who, who are undocumented, who were undocumented. Um, we were told that, you know, we're supposed to come to this country and not make any noise, put our heads down and work, uh, you know, kind of keep within our community, don't make a lot of noise. Uh, and so um, there came a point where uh, my, my friends and the people that I, you know, started organizing with, we were sick of that. We were so sick of it. And so, 
um, we needed to be a voice and we needed to um, speak up for ourselves to say that, uh, you know, our needs were not being met. It, and it, it all started through like the government not acknowledging us, but culturally, um, I think there's a lot of, uh, uh, there's a lot of hypocrisy uh, mm -hmm. around, um, uh, you know, us uh, Americans or American, uh, the US really loving some cultures. Um, I'm not from Mexico, but I would say like the Mexican culture, like they love the food uh, and similar to other cultures, they love the food, they love our food, they love our culture, they love the language they love, but they don't want us. They mm -hmm. don't want humans to be um, uh, as individuals and as communities to be part of this, of this country, but they're willing to um, extract some of the, the best parts of our culture. Mm -hmm. um, and so for us, it, it was, it was very much like, well, you know, we're here, we're not going to leave. Uh, <laughs> we're not leaving. Um, you can't force us to leave. So it's, it, it's either that we go back into the shadows and that was not going to happen. Um, or you acknowledge us and actually um, give us and give us our space to claim who we are and, and what we contribute to this country, but also what this country also um, also like owes us in a way. And that and what it owes us is at least an acknowledgement and of and a treatment of, of a human being. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, no, all excellent points. And so I kind of if we can move to this next section and I'll just tee it up a little bit. You know, as humans, I think inherently we have this kind of atavistic tendency towards tribalism, you know, this us versus them. And perhaps it was like a survival instinct, right, to kind of recognize somebody who could potentially be a threat because they looked unfamiliar um, and unknown. And what happens when, and typically that's one of our baser instincts. Um, but if as a society, as civilized societies, we organize ourselves to kind of um, not allow those baser instincts to rule us. But what we find in this case of, uh, with othering, we find that entire systems are built to uh, not only perpetuate othering, but also celebrate it, right? And we have people who are willing to exploit our baser tendency towards othering for political gain. And that has such a devastating impact in a very real human sense. So if you would play that um, second clip sign. Ich arbeite hauptsächlich mit Roma-Familien, Flüchtlinge aus dem Bürgerkrieg in Ex-Jugoslawien. Diese Familien, die eben halt alle drei Monate, manchmal sogar alle zwei bis drei Wochen hingehen müssen, um äh, ihre Duldungen zu verlängern. Und äh, das ist sowieso schon der blanke Horror für die Leute. Ja. Viele derer, die aber auch Roma sind, so wie ich, die halt integriert in der Gesellschaft sind, die werden gar nicht wahrgenommen. Das liegt auch mit daran, dass sich die meisten von uns ganz einfach selbst verleugnen. Ich meine, keiner hat einfach Bock, irgendwie einen Job zu verlieren, weil er Zigeuner ist. Oder als Zigeuner gesehen wird. Ich bin kein Zigeuner, ich bin Rom. Zigeuner ist halt äh, fremdbezeichnend und eigentlich beleidigend für mich. Haben Sie sich eigentlich bekannt als Roma in Ihrer Schulzeit? Nein, auf gar keinen Fall, <lacht> um Gottes Willen. Es war auch immer schlimm gewesen, wenn es dann rausgekommen ist. Also ich meine, es war halt immer komisch, ne? ich bin halt recht dunkel und wenn ich an den Leuten gesagt habe, wenn sie mich gefragt haben, ja, wo kommst denn du her? Und dann dachte ich, ja, ich bin Jugoslawe, das war sowieso schon mal so ein bisschen komisch, aber gut, da ging es noch. Schwer wurde es dann, wenn man dann wirklich einen Jugoslawen getroffen hat und der mit einem Jugoslawe sprechen konnte und man konnte es überhaupt gar nicht. <lacht> ja, das, das, dann ist es dann halt meistens rausgekommen und ähm, dann wurde es schwer. Also ich habe auch äh, Schläger deswegen gekriegt. Es hieß dann, du scheißt Zigeuner und bam, schon hat es Schwein auf die Nase. Möchten Sie Sinti und Roma zu Nachbarn haben? Das war die Frage in einer Studie und 58 Prozent der Befragten sagten nein. So groß sind die Vorbehalte gegen... Was es für mich bedeutet, als Roma in Deutschland zu leben, 
Ja, es ist halt schon so ein bisschen immer fremd sein im eigenen Land. Also ich bin zwar in Deutschland geboren, aber ich habe noch keinen deutschen Pass. Das ist eine Sache, die ich jetzt bald auch nachholen. Also ich meine, ich darf in meinem eigenen Land nicht wählen und das ist eigentlich eine Riesenschweinerei alleine. Ich meine, wir sind jetzt schon, ich weiß nicht, ich glaube 15 Millionen Menschen offiziell in der EU. Wir, wir, wir stellen eine größere Gemeinschaft mittlerweile dar als manches EU-Land. Irgendwie sowas muss von uns selber ausgehen, dass wir uns irgendwie zusammentun und organisieren. So, my name is Sandeep Singh. You can call me Sunny if you want to. Um, I'm from the Sikh Coalition. And one of the big issues that we've been concerned with, because it's a, a huge concern to our community, is bullying in schools. The kind of bullying that we're talking about in this room is what we call bias-based bullying. It's when you're bullied because of how you look or because of your culture or your gender or a host of things. Um, raise your hand if you've ever been teased, harassed, threatened, um, called, called names, made fun of. Kids in my class ask me why you have that thing. I have told them like a million times, but they never like stop asking. So even though you explain it to them, they still keep asking you. Yeah. I was in school. Somebody pulled my butka off. Someone pulled your butka off. Wow. I always just say stop, but they keep on like pulling me. Just because, just because I have long hair. Like boys gonna have long hair. Of course. In wrestling, I saw. What is it that we need in our lives that are basic necessities? One is work authorization, right? Everyone needs to work, everyone needs to, to earn a decent living wage, okay? Two, access to a driver's license or state ID. I don't have an ID, it's really difficult. Many of us know exactly what that's like, right? The simplest things that no one can think of. We can't even go to the post office to take out a package. So these are the basic things that we are asking for and we feel these are basic necessities. Um, just incredible. Um, so Christina, what we saw in those clips were um, examples of othering, certainly on, a, on an ind individual level, um, but also about um, when, when Tanya talks about the basic necessities and that not being made available, available to them, about othering on a systemic level. So in both Germany and the US, um, the systems of whether it's immigration or social services or policing or security, um, talk to us a little bit about how the very design of these systems um, are responsible for what we're experiencing today. So in other words, it's not that the system is broken, the system is working exactly as it was designed. It just has not adapted to the reality of today. Right, or we are still working to actually transform it to be something that it can be. Um, you know, US and Germany share a few things and certainly one of them is their history as being, you know, part of, European colonialism. So the US is a former colony that is also colonized in Latin America and in the Pacific. And, and the, the types of um, exclusion share a particular history, I think that's rooted in sort of racial capitalism and white supremacy. And so who has had access to citizenship, who has had access to rights has always been racialized in the US. We never, unfortunately had a, had a country that was um, based on this idea of a multiracial democracy. It was always racialized. I mean, we, we first of all came in, in this country, uh, stole land and committed genocide. So there's that, there's that piece of it also. But I think um, it is one of those pieces of the conversation when we talk about immigration that, that somehow often gets completely ignored. First of all, that many of the people who are coming to the US and, and Europe are directly coming because of policies by these countries abroad. So, you know, in the case of, of um, both recruiting people in as workers, recruiting people in uh, or going in with military uh, force in different countries and, and displacing people for all kinds of reasons. And then also that these citizenship laws have all been crafted around preserving 
the sort of the rights of certain groups of people and extracting the labor and resources from other groups of people. So I think, um, yes, you're absolutely right. The system is working as it was designed to work and we are actually working to transform it to make it something better. Um, and my, my family immigrated from Greece the early 20th century when many people um, immigrated from Eastern and Southern Europe. And this was around the time, you know, with the Chinese Exclusion Act in the late 1800s and then in the early 20th century when um, sort of there were national um, identity categories starting to be placed onto immigration to the US. Prior to that, there was pretty much open immigration for everyone from Europe um, and actually the rest of the world, but especially from Europe. And then it started to be, okay, Asians are being excluded. Now, um, you know, certain European countries are being controlled. Um, Eastern and Southern European countries are being controlled. And then we're introducing all of these um, legal control path, like these, the paperwork that had never actually existed before that now makes certain categories of people illegal just by walking maybe from one part of their town to the other part of their town, as the case is on the US-Mexico border where the border was redrawn and redrawn through people's communities, indigenous communities that had been there for you know, millennia. Um, so whenever someone talks about people being illegal or should have gone through this the right way or whatever, I just really want people to look at the history and understand how um, their ancestors didn't have to go through any legal process for the most part. They just got in a boat, showed up, got off, and, and were actually um, offered land if they would go and <laughs> go west. So um, there's a lot to unpack about how this country has been born and who's been, I mean, they've been, you know, the, the origin story of this country really has to be unpacked. And as much as some of us might feel really familiar with it overall, the narrative that is shared is deeply distorted and there's a real re like learning process that we need to be undergoing together. The, uh, the other thing that I was um, in watching Sunny um, and also um, Akim in the movie, um, you know, the, the, the othering that you experienced here in the US because of the way you look. Um, and I think it was really poignant when you talked about how when you were a kid, you wish you were called John and you would play basketball, you wanted to cut off your hair. And to me, that really crystallizes the problem we are, uh, we've come up against. You know, the system doesn't work any longer because we are not just all coming from Western Europe with one way tickets. Um, we can't just give up, you know, I, it's not like I can give up eating curry and change my name and suddenly tomorrow I will be all American, which was, is really the premise under which, you know, Toni Morrison called this the kind of cultural mechanics of becoming American. Those mechanics worked when you had largely Western, Northern Europe, uh, Anglo-Saxon, you know, white Caucasian people coming here. They don't work. And to see how, um, you know, Sunny articulate that kind of almost not wanting to be different, which is a very, you know, normal human reaction. But at the same time, Sunny, I was really interested in the movie. When you went to Punjab for your immersion, you did still not feel like you belong there, right? Which is the same thing that Akim talked about in the opening scene. Like, I'm, I don't belong in Vietnam. I don't belong um, in Germany. So talk to us a little bit about the othering that you feel. Yeah, I mean, ab absolutely, absolutely. And I, I think certainly that that's, that's a, something that a lot of uh, us children of immigrants experience, right? Where we are not fully accepted. We don't fully belong uh, here in the U.S. or in, or in Europe, and also, uh, you know, we don't in our in our in our uh, the country of our parents, the country of our ancestors, the land of our ancestors, either. Um, but I just sort of another layer that I would want to add to, uh, you know, specifically about uh, where where my people fit into this. Sort of picking up where Christina left off, thinking about how this system was built is how. Indian Americans and Asian Americans more broadly have been very strategically used as a wedge against black folks and other communities of, of color, right? And so in 1965, we have this massive change in US immigration law 
which my family was a direct beneficiary of, right? Mm -hmm. My dad came, who's here right now, <laughs> came, uh, came to study engineering, get a master's in engineering at the University of Minnesota in 1969, because it was very easy for somebody like him to get that student visa to come study engineering, mm -hmm. right? There was literally mm -hmm. sort of a rec recruitment process happening from immigration and natural, naturalization services uh, for people just like my dad, right? Mm -hmm. uh, to study engineering, to study medicine, to get visas, to do the sort of hard sciences, right? There was a need for this labor pool, but as Tanya said before, not a need for uh, our holistic lives, right? Yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, in 1965, we're in the midst of the Black Freedom Movement, right? We're in the midst of massive social upheaval against white supremacy, demanding racial and economic justice. And so then we bring in a highly educated group of brown people and say, oh, look how well they're doing, right? Mm -hmm. So what, what Black folks, uh, you know, Chicano folks, what are you complaining about racism? There's no racism here in the United States because look at these Indian doctors, right? Um, and unfortunately, too many in our community have bought into that narrative, right? Um, uh, I'm glad that my parents have not, uh, but many, uh, many people in our community have, right? And anti-Black racism is deeply, deeply embedded uh, in our communities and, and it's not a coincidence, right? Um, again, Absolutely, it, yeah. I mean, we you know, the, the, to your point about the South Asian community and how we buy into the model minority and somehow feel that it is because of our, because we are exceptional that we are treated different from other people of color when the truth is, is we were brought here for a very specific purpose when America was losing the Cold War and needed a certain kind of people. Um, but again, um, and Tanya, you talked about kind of, you know, I belong to Jackson Heights. That's where I feel like I belong. It's so diverse, it's so beautiful. So certainly there are, um, you know, there are pockets where we all feel like we belong. We have these belonging circles. Um, and then there are always areas, I feel like I belong when I go to any kind of like, you know, soccer mom <laughs> gathering, you know, I'm at home, right? <laughs> but um, for people like Tanya, who, you know, you clearly um, find belonging or acceptance in Jackson Heights, but you were fighting for kind of moving beyond that, you know, to get the same kind of capability to, to do things that other people can. And, um, you know, so that that was really powerful. Now, you know, in the interest of time, what I'm gonna do is play the next clip because I think um, the issue around framing and I think there's some um, footage of Tanya in, in North Carolina that is super compelling. So if you would just move to that son. Das heißt, keine freien Macht. Länder hat mit Vietnam zu tun. Also sehr, sehr arm, sehr arm alles. Und ich denke, die Leute sind dann halt dann gezwungen, das und jene zu machen, Kinder wegzugeben. Die werden wie Kinder behandelt, aber die müssen halt mehr anpacken als die eigentlichen Kinder. Also, ich habe schon ganz früh angefangen zu arbeiten. Ich bekomme immer ein Geimpf, wo ich meinen Wurzel habe. Andererseits beschreiben die Leute mich als diejenigen, die entwurzelt sind, rausgerupft aus einem anderen Erde, reingesetzt woanders und muss mich halt hier mutieren, um klarzukommen. America was founded in godly trust and in godly still trust and with that the Lord will bless this country again with tradition, courage and a people for the people. Conclusion? P.S. We do want our country back. <laughs> She's not very good at racism. It's too really, really too vague. Who's the we and who's the, who are you taking the country back from? A matter of time to get heckled. It's such a fat baby. It's another one of me in Bolivia. My family came to the United States in the late 1980s. 
my dad in the army. It's from the US. The CIA put infiltrated into the Bolivian um, army. And they were trained by them. Because of international free trade and experiments done on politically weak countries, which was Bolivia at the time. My father, he was a college graduate, but he had to work like three jobs. But it still wasn't enough for us to survive, basically. We didn't leave because we wanted to leave, had to leave Bolivia because of the American policies. For my own sake, I don't have a place where I feel like I belong. I feel I belong in Jackson Heights, <laughs> which is like the most diverse city in, in the world. So um, really powerful um, stuff. And I think that particular clip that we saw, to me, it highlighted um, the kind of issue around framing and narrative. You know, um, the nation myths and lore and um, kind of historical accounts of events, they all kind of play a very important role in propping up oppressive systems. Right, um, we all like eat pluribus unum, right? We all, this is liberty and rights and justice for all, send me your unwashed masses and all of that stuff, right? The reality is quite different. And I think with Tanya and talking to Tanya, the couple of issues that I saw, um, you know, people, when they talk, especially in the far right, they're very good at crafting narratives that are very simplistic. And on the surface, they make sense. So when you look at people at the border trying to come in, trying to kind of scale the walls, the narrative is you, the hardworking taxpayer, they're coming here to steal that from you. You're paying, you're footing the bill. You know, you, you, they get health care. They're coming here for cushy stuff. Um, and so they frame it very narrowly. And of course, if you didn't know about history and you leave out the, the context beyond it, then uh, you, you and a lot of immigrants, especially, you know, and to Sunny Smart, people who have come here recently who don't know the history of the land buy into that narrative. And to them, they're like, of course, that sounds wrong. You know, I came here legally. Why the heck can't the rest of them come legally? Right. Um, but what when you said, um, Tanya, especially the point where like I'm the one who babysat your kids. Right. And also your story about the reason and you didn't want to leave your family didn't decide one day that they would come here to the US because they they thought things are better here. So talk to us a little bit about kind of that part of the narrative that gets left out and how you work that you know how what kind of counter narrative you offer in your work. Yeah, um, so Thank you for that. It, it, it is a very moving scene. It was a very moving, uh, still very difficult for me to watch just because it's, um, it, there's a lot of, there was a lot of emotion that day um, and, and continues to be uh, in a lot of the work that I do. But um, uh, the, the part about me saying, well, you know, I'm, I'm somebody who does babysit your, your kids, who cleans your homes, who, you know, um, delivers your food, uh, we're sort of an unseen, you know, not supposed to be seen culture. And so now when um, the ways that I've seen uh, really people show up who work in these industries and are, and are undocumented is actually through the labor movement. Um, we've seen a lot of really incredible organizing happening of delivery, delivery uh, workers uh, happening in New York. And they're saying, hey, you know, this is not, this is about me being an immigrant, but this is about my labor. And especially after COVID, 
you must respect my labor and what I bring to the table. And that is, I fed you during COVID. It was because of me that you survived <laughs> during COVID um, and, and so forth, right, with other industries. So, so I think through labor, uh, it's just such an important um, aspect and intersectionality that, that exists in the immigration movement. And what we're trying to do is we're trying to prove a point that um, one, our labor is important, but two, you know, and, and I want to emphasize this that I think some groups are very careful to do this, is that it's, it's not just about um, the economy, it's about our humanity as well. Um, and, it, and it's about race and it's about how uh, um, all these other factors. So um, not everybody does that, but I, I know some groups are very conscious of doing that and not just making it about I'm, you know, I'm a dollar bill and, and this is this is what I'm, it's, it's about really mm -hmm. um, having the whole person come out. Yeah. And, and Christina, maybe um, I know that your life's work now is about kind of offering these counter narratives and empowering people in the social justice, racial equity movement with new ways of framing the issue so people get the whole truth. So can you give us some examples of reframing that would help people um, understand this and advocate better? Yeah, thanks Usha for that question. I, and I think that from the beginning, as we've been talking about this, we've been reframing it the whole time, right? So it, it, we're not starting now. So for, for one thing, just making this film in two countries was already uh, a reframe. We talk about immigration as a national issue. We think about this as a national issue. This is a global reality. People are moving all over the world. Pretty much every corner of the world is touched by this issue, either because people are being sent or forced or displaced or people are coming. And so, so one is just to get out of thinking that we can solve this by protecting our national borders or con controlling our own population and instead looking this as a global system and a global reality. Reality. That's one thing and a historical constant, something that has, has always happened. And I think also as, as something positive, something that actually allows, you know, your work Usha is very much about bringing artists together to exchange and artists have, you know, always exchanged. That's where um, creativity flourishes by being exposed to new ideas, by being challenged by new aesthetic experiences. And so it's so often that the most generative art in the world throughout human history has been in these places where cultures came together, where trade happened, where people moved. And that's still true today in terms of major cities around the world where artists from all over the world come together and exchange ideas. So I think just starting to, to, to think about the positive things that come from this kind of exchange rather than only talking about the challenges or only talking about the crises. Um, I also think that thinking about, uh, you know, our identities as fluid and as changing and as expansive instead of as being sort of rigid and, and confined by groups, all of us are you know, connected to groups. And as you said, we need to belong. We need to be part of groups. We need that for our survival. But we're also beings that are more bigger than any of these identity categories that, um, that may be useful for a certain given period of time and then may not be useful anymore at another given time. So just understanding that, um, that, that we are way more complex than any of the categories that could be imposed upon us. And we need to stop policing people <laughs> along identity categories along those lines. So those are some of the, some of the things. Um, I guess the last thing also is that I think with this film, I'm hoping to show that young people in particular, young people who have been most impacted by these experiences of the, sort of the crosshairs of the immigration debates, the actual policies that affect people life, they have solutions to offer. And we need to look to those voices and, and elevate them um, to, to try to find pathways out of here. So and you, you, you mentioned um, kind of the hope and, and opportunity, you know, I, I don't know where I heard this, but the Chinese character for uh, crisis, it consists of kind of danger and opportunities made up of two strokes. One stroke is danger and the other is opportunity. And so, yes, a lot of what we heard was heavy and, um, sometimes it's easy to get down on it. And, um, but at the same time, I also feel like this moment is different. We seem to be, we seem to have worked, painted ourselves into a corner where almost evolution is required for survival to some extent. So it seems pregnant with opportunity. Um, and so what I'd love to do now is to kind of starting with Sunny, maybe talk about 
you know, what, how are you um, using your practice, your activism, your, your work um, to take advantage of this opportunity? And I know Sunny's gonna share with us something special, so. Yeah, um, well, a, a big part of my work is as a, as a musician. And uh, I think as, as artists, our work is much more about uh, cultivating feelings and emotions uh, than a political analysis or a strategy, uh, which I sometimes do in other parts of my life. But uh, uh, right now, a big part of my musical practice is a new, a new project, Deeply Inspired, uh, by uh, sick revolutionary poetry and devotional poetry um, that I that I learned when I was a kid and have sort of reinterpreted and uh, and combined with lots of different genres that have influenced me as a musician um, and the name of the album that will be released uh, at an unknown date is uh, Chardikala, which is this idea in the Sikh community of revolutionary optimism that even in the darkest of times in our community has certainly seen some very, very dark times. Um, we, we have this sort of spiritual and political duty to remain in high spirits, this sort of steadfast determination to keep our heads up and fight another day uh, because we know that if we keep uh, our, our devotion for, the, for the, the force that connects us all at the center, if we lead uh, with the voices of those most oppressed uh, that we only have, uh, we can only go up, right? We can only rise. Um, and so uh, if now is a good time, I can share uh, the music video for the title track of, of the record, which is uh, called Chardvikala. Um, and okay, here it is.
That was awesome. Sai, that was <laughs> beautiful. Um, and Tanya, before we get to the q and I know folks have a lot of questions, but I would love for you to talk about, you know, your practice and what you're focused on and what gives you hope and how are you pursuing opp um, opportunity? Yeah, no, thank you. Um, I always love watching uh, Sunny's videos and music. So it really is a treat uh, for me to watch. Um, uh, and to share with us. Thank you, Sunny. Um, so right now I am currently working as the um, monitoring and policy manager for the Northeast for a nonprofit called Freedom for Immigrants. And our work is to uh, end immigration detention across the country. And um, we're very close <laughs> to doing that actually. Um, there's great momentum right now to really close some facilities and we've seen cl uh, the closure of facilities now. And, um, and yeah, I mean, uh, that's my, my dream is to see immigrants free, uh, to see all people free uh, and, and not have to live in, in cages and um, go through these horrendous, horrendous experiences that, you know, currently people have to endure uh, uh, around prison. And Christina, um, just to offer our, um, audience perhaps with a few things that they can, actions that they can take uh, in their own spheres of influence um, that can possibly help change the conversation and frame things differently if you have a few tips and then we are going to go to Q&A. Yeah, I'll try to keep it quick because I know there's so much um, that we could, and you know this film really touches on so many issues. So I would say um, one thing you can do is just actually literally go and visit our impact and education website with wingsandroots.org. You can learn about history. You can sign up for our newsletter where we'll share more resources. You can share your own story. Um, part of this work is also doing our own healing, sharing our own story, getting these stories out there. You can do that. Um, but obviously I think there's a million ways to be in solidarity from interrupting conversations when someone call, refers to undocumented people as illegal. There's a real opportunity to teach people who, who, who maybe have never even been introduced to other language. You have, there's little opportunities like that to actually calling and demanding political change um, in terms of, there's a number of bills that like right now in the US Congress that are, are you know, would provide pathways to citizenship for, for immigrants. So there's kind of a million things um, that you can do or we can do. And some of those resources are available on our website. So go to our website and connect with us. And if you have more ways you'd like to connect, feel free to just shoot me an email and I'm happy to continue the conversation. Wonderful. Um, thank you all so much. And I know we have a few questions. Please folks feel free to drop your questions. I know we're gonna go over um, the allotted time, but I think this is a fabulous conversation and um, it's great to see all of you engaged. So we have uh, Ivona says for Tanya and Sunny, can you talk a little bit about what it was like for you to have aspects of your life filmed over a number of years? So you wanna go first, Sunny, yeah. Sure, um, it was uh, bizarre at times, uh, but got easier uh, and you know, at, at a certain point, it's kind of fun to you know, have a camera following you around. It sort of inflates your sense of self-importance. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm joking, but, but <laughs> only, only, only a little bit. Um, but, uh, but honestly, you know, er, very, very early on with Christina, she really built such a trusting rapport. And, uh, and so it was really easy to, to, you know, be vulnerable with her and uh, give her sort of like full, full access to everything that I was involved in. And I think ultimately what motivated me to do that was I just didn't really see stories like like mine being told, right? Stories uh, from my community um, and from activists in my community uh, being being told in documentary films. So um, it felt in some ways like a responsibility to open myself up to that. Wonderful, and Tanya? Uh, just quickly, um, yeah, Christina made it very easy to, uh, there were some moments that were a little bit uh, difficult um, and that, you know, um, we had a difference of opinion in including and, and shooting. But um, overall, I think that uh, it, it, was, it was a great experience and, and do not regret it because uh, she really captured crazy moments in my life. Uh, but really it's from the moment, you know, I came out as undocumented to 
even the moment where I actually got my green card. So, um, and that took, that took a long time, but she was, she was there for the whole process. Um, and I have, next question is for, um, uh, this is from Mia and says, I'm not sure how to phrase this question, but I was thinking about the scene where the boys were saying they had faced bias-based bullying. How can we teach our children to be anti-racist and how can the education system help children who are affected by bias-based bullying? Uh, Sunny, you want to take that because you're in education. <laughs> sure. Uh, I mean, the, it's it's hard to answer that in a succinct fac fashion, but I can tell you some of the things that that I think are good good starting points. And in terms of uh, working with our our young people and our families and our communities, um, I think one of the most important things is. Uh, for, for them to share their stories, right? To, to not, because I know what I did when I was a kid, which was I kind of bottled it up and I didn't really talk about it. And I know that's what a lot of kids do. Um, and it's this sort of like either super inwardly focused, uh, which can lead to all sorts of really horrible self-harm and lack of self-confidence and all this, or the extreme opposite, which is just like driven by anger and, and violence. And both are very understandable responses. And so I think the more opportunities we give young people to engage in honest conversation, sharing our experiences with one another, um, with one another as youth, but also with adults that they trust that can give them the, the space that they need to like really talk about what's happening in, in their lives and in their schools. I think it's so, so critical. Um, I have plenty of thoughts about education curriculum and stuff as well, but I'll, I'll leave it at that for, for now. Yeah, and maybe so you can send us some pointers and resources that we can send along in the email that we send out. So what we will do is compile uh, all the links that Christina and others have been dropping in here, because there's obviously many different threads and we'd be happy to collate all of that and share it. Um, thank you so much. But again, please, I encourage all of you to seek out um, these artists and, and Christina, Tanya, um, Sunny and follow their work and they're doing important work. Um, these next, I'm gonna combine two questions because they're for you, um, Christina. Um, can you talk a little bit about what it was like to make the film? How did it get started and how long did it take to film and edit? And then related to that, Melissa asks, after filming for 10 years, how did the changing national conversation uh, affect the story arc? Yeah, that's a, it's, it is um, a very big question. How was making the film? Um, challenging, powerful, on an individual level, just the opportunity to um, get to not just spend as much time as I did kind of immersed in the lives of these incredible people who you see on the screen with me, but also like just deeply um, an inquiry around these questions. It's a real, um, it's a real privilege and honor that I was able to kind of create that space in my life for that. Um, also really challenging, um, you know, this is a work of art, but sort of the film world saw, saw, sort of treated it as too political and the sort of activist space, it was too much of an art piece and it was very complex and it didn't fit very well into the categories of advocacy work. And so um, it, it's hard to get funding for a first time feature director period. So I don't wanna make that an individual thing, but there was also something about the complexity of the approach of this film that didn't fit very easily into a sort of a quick one-liner elevator pitch. So that meant that we really had to be scrappy and resourceful and the collaboration around this film um, involved not just the film, but the impact work, the education work we've done. We've done, you know, many, many workshops and events and, and installations and panels and um, more than a hundred people have collaborated mostly on a voluntary basis to create all this work. And so that has really spoken to how many people are sort of hungry for this kind of approach these kind of stories, even though it's hard to synthesize into an elevator pitch. There are many people who want more than an elevator pitch who are tired of that. Um, and yeah, um, yeah, but deeply, I also feel just as, as I said, deeply blessed to have had the opportunity to be so close with these the people in the film and my collaborators. And in terms of how the political context changed, it's interesting because, uh, you know, when I started, I really felt that our conversation was like very coded. There were all about immigration. There was, it was all about the legality or not and people going doing it the right way. And I was like, this is, we're, we're not actually talking about the issues. Um, the policies were just as restrictive in many ways, uh, whether it was under a Republican or a Democratic administration. Um, and then Donald Trump came on the scene and the 
you know, AFD in Germany, the far right parties kept growing. Um, and so it went from being something that I thought was existential and urgent when I started to something that just was becoming increasingly and increasingly like, um, I don't know how to describe it, really, really existential for so many people in this country. When Donald Trump was on television calling people um, rapists, murderers, criminals, um, just the level of dehumanization, I can only say that it echoed back to other genocidal regimes we've seen around the world. We've seen that same kind of rhetoric lead to mass killing. So for me, and I, I, I don't think I was alone, it was terrifying um, and, and just sort of like ripped off the, the, the you know, the cover um, that had just been covering the sort of rotten core that had been affecting people for, for generations, but now it was all for, for all of us to see. It was just laid bare and emboldening all the people who were just waiting for an opportunity to be emboldened and really sort of twisting the, um, the story of why we are where we are. So, um, so the urgency increased my ability to bring all of that into the film. You know, we only touch on it, I think, towards the end. Um, but I think that there's a, um, something important in that, that, that it's not about one bad politician. It's not about a Donald Trump. Um, this is a, an entire system that needs to be transformed. People's lives have been, you know, families have been being torn apart for f far longer than one, one administration. So, um, so I hope that by not focusing it on Donald Trump, although we get to Donald Trump, that, that it allows us to see that this issue is gonna accompany us far beyond um, this administration into the future. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. I mean, there was actually one clip that um, we wanted to share, which was about kind of Donald Trump's um, election and the impact it had on people and, and, you know, the existential threat that it posed to many people, including uh, the work that Tanya was doing and, and to dreamers and so on. It was just really powerful. There's no denying it. Um, Naili says, um, since we often told as immigrants that we have to be extraordinarily talented humans to belong to this country, we have to be an Einstein in order to merit a place here. And so as a first gen college student, I often feel pressured to be this extraordinary person. I don't, uh, so I don't feel that I was brought here for nothing. I realize that this is of course a bad mentality to have. Uh, however, it's difficult not to feel this way. Thus, I was wondering what tips you guys, uh, Tanya and Sunny would give immigrants who feel this way. So Tanya, you want to take that? Yeah, um, well, just to also uh, to let you know that um, uh, you're not alone in feeling that way. Uh, many, many, many people, uh, individuals feel that way. And there's a sense of guilt uh, that, you know, I think um, uh, is very uh, natural. Um, uh, but, you know, you kind of have to realize like what, sort of realize for yourself like what is the structure uh what is that all about um we kind of have to look behind the veil of of why why we're sort of set to think that way you know i still have feelings that way of of feeling guilty not being able to you know fully support my family my parents the way that i feel that i that i feel like i should um but one thing i i would say like you know in the years that i've i've been doing this work and um just in my mid-30s now is is that your happiness overall, um, that is what your parents want, is, is for you to be happy, for you to be safe. Um, and yeah, uh, I bet they want you to be doctors and rocket scientists and all that. But uh, at the end of the day, um, I think you should, uh, you should do what you love. Uh, because if not, then I, I believe that um, individuals end up being uh, a little bit unhappy with not following their passion and their mm -hmm. true calling. Um, yeah. So, uh, yeah, those are the few words. Sunny. Yeah, I don't. I don't have too much to add, but uh, I, I think I think Tanya kind of oh, kind yeah. of nailed it. But I think yeah, giving yourself grace and and we're we're in this together. Um, so I think approaching it all with with solidarity is is the way. 
Yeah. Uh, and if it helps, Naili, I think part of it is to kind of see that that kind of thinking that you need to be exceptional is a trap, right? It is the, what contributes to the model minority myth. It is what allows people and white supremacy to kind of drive a wedge between people. So we're all humans, right? We will, as all humans, we, we will all lie on a distribution so for any given um, kind of achievement. There'll be some that are high achievers and some that are in the middle and we all make up the, the whole. And so there's place for everyone and we cannot make belonging um, and self-worth tied to achievement, um, you know? And so that's a process for all, a lot of us, but I think you bring up a very good point about how, especially for immigrants, um, this notion of kind of you owe it. But the other way to think about it is who do you owe it to, right? Do you owe it to the people that colonized this place and selectively let your, your parents in? Or do you owe it to the indigenous people whose land uh, created this opportunity and the system. So sometimes reframing, um, and, and and to be honest, sometimes I find that within minority communities, especially those that are kind of favored, um, there is the sense that you don't want to cause trouble. You know, you you have to be grateful to the people that let you in and the systems that let you in. Um, and really, uh, in my mind, the way I counter that is to really think, think about the bigger picture and see if you have to be grateful to somebody, you should be grateful to the people that fought for civil rights. You know, Dr. King, Cesar Chavez, all of these people whose backs we climbed on to get where we did, right? The fact that Sonny, your dad, and that I could come here, you know, waltzing in on a visa, upwardly mobile with all the skills I need. Uh, we wouldn't have been allowed all, with all of that if it weren't for the Heart Seller Act, which is a direct result of the civil rights movement. So if we want to feel we owe someone something, I think we really need to kind of put that in the right place. So, um, and one more question. Uh, Parmi says, it's striking to me how the issues you raise in your film remain relevant today, 10 years later. Uh, how do we as a community accelerate the change we want to see? Uh, and I think you touched upon it a little bit, but if um, Christina, you want to add to it, Um, hi, Parmi. Um, Parmi, if, I don't know which Parmi it is, but I imagine it might be brothers, Sunny's brother might not be. Um, <laughs> how do we accelerate the change? I think we are accelerating the change by being in this conversation right now and by continuing the conversation. I, I definitely, I hope that, um, you know, we can be taking uh, some as we just said, evolutionary steps together and recognizing that um, the solutions are not only gonna happen at a political level, they're also gonna happen through transforming ourselves and our relationships to one another. So if we can be working on all those levels at the same time, um, but we're not gonna also solve this issue without really addressing economic injustice, right? Migration doesn't happen in a vacuum. We have to talk about an economic system that's based on exploitation. We have to talk about all of these things in, in parallel and start really, you know, like kind of peeling, uh, peeling away the layers that have kept us from seeing the bigger picture. So um, yeah, so I hope at least I'm putting my, I'm putting my faith in, in all of these small steps that we're taking together and trusting the process of, of being with each other, um, that we're doing the work that we need to do to get where we need to go. Thank you, thank you. Uh, we have one more question and then I think we'll start to wrap up. Um, we have um, an anonymous attendee who said, can teenagers volunteer to help freedom for immigrants? What can I as a high schooler do to help this cause? Um, yeah, um, that, that's great. That's a great question. Um, when you can write to people inside, uh, you, can, you can write them a, a letter. Uh, you know, you can have your classroom or your school um, do a, a letter drive. They need a lot of inspiration there. They go through very difficult moments of solitary confinement, of, of different uh, different things they've gone through. And, and for the fact, uh, they're being held in their immigration case it, and, and it's not for anything else really. Um, so um, I would say get you know your school and your friends to write letters of support for them. If you wanna raise a little bit of money, commissary for money uh, for them would be would be great too. And then uh, I, I in the chat box, I added a link uh, to where you can connect with a local visitation group that can responsibly um, distribute those funds for you uh, and, and have individuals that they'd be able to distribute the, the, the money that you fundraise. Um, yeah, because uh, it, it's an industry, the detention uh, system is an industry. And so everything in there is three times as expensive as it is outside. So 
um, thank you so much for, for willing to participate. Thank you for that. Um, so that is, uh, that is it. I, I haven't left out any questions, I hope. Um, but folks, please rest assured that we will um, send around after this event, probably tomorrow the day after, um, an email that, that kind of lists all of these resources and we add to it anything that our panelists send us afterwards. Um, I would also like to give a shout out to our team at mosaicamerica.org. We have an incredible, highly motivated team of people who do a lot of work. Yes, I'm so um, you know, honored and proud um, to call them my colleagues. Um, please do visit our website, mosaicamerica.org. And if you're interested in joining our movement, which is a movement to cultivate belonging, uh, join us for an open house that we are going to have on the 29th. And again, you can go to mosaicamerica.org to find more information. You can find us on Facebook and uh, Instagram as well. And at this point, I would like to welcome back uh, Sayer and Robin to see if there's any last words you'd like to share. Um, and then be ready to wrap up. This has been a wonderful conversation. I'm so grateful to you, Sunny, Christina, Tanya, for not only sharing this 90 minutes with us, but also, you know, nine years of your life. I think um, you can all take a lot of pride in knowing that your work has moved um, many people and will continue to do so. Robin. Thank you so much, Usha. It's been um, a fabulous, a fabulous event actually. It's a wonderful film, um, Christina. Thank you so much for uh, making it, for your dedication to making it, which I'm sure cannot have been easy. And to all the people who were profiled um, in it and willing to share their stories and tell their stories. And uh, I really, um, I really appreciate that. I loved the film, I thought it was great. So I hope a lot more people get to see it. And Usha, can I, um, but in on one of the questions before. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> That's why so I'm going to go out on a limb here a little bit, but this seems like the night to do it. And you know, I'm somewhat prone to doing that. <laughs> I was um, very interested in Niall's question about being extraordinary and feeling that you have to do that mm -hmm. to be here and to be American and feeling guilty if you're not. I would ask everybody to reconsider what they consider extraordinary. Mm -hmm. We tend to look at that through a certain lens, in a certain context, in a certain frame that is in and of itself a problem. Meritocracy is a myth. Mm -hmm. Think about extraordinariness in terms of values, what mm -hmm. you value and what should be valued as opposed to what is valued. Mm -hmm. The kind of contribution to a society that we typically think of as extraordinary is so narrowly construed and narrowly confined. And if you think about it, if only those extraordinary people were on earth, if they were the only people we ever had to think about building a world and building a society, we wouldn't have it mm -hmm. because that's not really where society or culture or a livable community comes from. Mm -hmm. It comes from all of those anonymous people who are extraordinary by being perfectly ordinary, mm -hmm. by going about their daily lives, by setting up society, by making schools and churches and, and creating community that's who does that, not the, not the extraordinary people. So That's we have right. to learn to value ourselves mm -hmm. and value our own values at the same level that we've been taught to value extraordinariness. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Anyway, very I'll shut nice. up. I said my piece. <laughs> That's very well Let said. Let me right. say it. <laughs> um, say are any last parting words? No, just words of thanks. And uh, we're in different settings now. And um, this has been a wonderful evening. Thank you so much for sharing the Third Thursday platform and your stories with us all. And I, I can't add anything to my colleague, Robin, and um, all of your wonderful words. Thank you. Thank you all. And uh, panelists, I just put in a message. So I'll look for an email from me so we can hop back and debrief. But thank you, everybody. Thank you for hanging in there with us. 
Um, we are only 10 minutes over time, but hopefully this was worth oh. That's fine for us. Oh, yeah. <laughs> we go on for another two hours, right? Oh, but yeah. Dinner plans. And um, thank you so much again. Much thank gratitude. Thank you, thank you, Sarah. Thank Robert. you, Mosaic. Yeah, thank you. Bye-bye, everybody. Thank yeah. you. Thanks, everyone. Good night.